This series of the Make Life Work podcast is supported by Little Warden. They monitor your website for the boring things that people often forget until it's too late, so you can concentrate on making more. Plans start from £25 a month, but Make Life Work listeners get an exclusive 60-day free trial, plus all the referrals will be doubled, especially for the mental health charity Mind. Get your account today at littlewarden.com slash work. Welcome along to another episode of the Make Life Work podcast. I am Cy Jobling at Cy on Twitter. And on this show, I talk to a range of people from around the tech scene about how they find a balance for work, life, well-being and side projects. This week, I've invited along Kevin Cunningham, a freelance web developer from Brighton. Kevin has recently taken the plunge into freelance development, following agency work and previously teaching. He's also a family man, avid camper, and also keen on his side projects like me. So, as always, I thought I'd invite him along to talk on the podcast. Time to find out more. How are you doing, Kevin? Yeah, I'm doing well, thanks, I. How are you? I'm pretty good. It's Friday. Yeah, it's not raining for the moment. I see blue skies outside, so that's oh, nice as well. I see blue skies, <laughs> and with that Irish twang, it sounds like you're singing almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the rain's good for an Irishman as well, so yeah, I'm doing very well. <laughs> You're accustomed, and I guess you, yeah. you live down on the coast, don't you, like on Brighton? Mm. Yeah, yeah, so the wind picks up a little bit, but um, yeah, we've avoided the recent storms for the most of them anyway, so oh. yeah, it's pretty good down here. You lucky uh, man, yeah, we've had some pretty terrible storms in the Midlands over the last mm. week, but you know, we persevere, we're British. Absolutely. Stiff upper lip. <laughs> cool. Right. Let's get on with it then. So before we get mm. into your current role, I'm intrigued about yeah. your background in education. Mm. So what took you down that route originally and some of the the good stuff let's talk about first? Yeah. So um, until a few years ago, I was, I was a teacher. Um, I was a math teacher. Um, and I got into that kind of sideways, I guess. So weirdly, it feels a bit weird, but from about 14 to 20, I was convinced I was going to be a Roman Catholic priest. Ah. So I spent some years training to do that. But at about 20, I thought, oh, I don't want to do this. And I'd done two out of three years of my maths undergraduate. So finished that up. And then teaching felt like a way to combine sort of like pastoral stuff, like people and maths. So I moved to Brighton, did my PGC and, and hung out around here, which was great. So teaching brilliant i really love teaching um there's those kind of moments of especially teaching maths you have that journey of people showing up in a classroom thinking i'm really bad at this and after a month or two seeing confidence start to grow and that was kind of the big bits of teaching was being able to be part of people's learning journey and seeing it positively impacted by that which is great and yeah i think so i was a teacher for 13 years and I think I managed to have the same job, the exact same job for maybe 12 months was the most I managed over that 13 years. So things that, you know, I'd take on more responsibilities, I'd do stuff outside of school, I'd um, maybe move school or, or get promotions or things like that. So that helped my um, hunger for new things as well. It was kind of like, oh yeah, I do this new thing over here, which is great. So, um, you know, I was head of maths for a while. I did some... Um, consultancy in other schools to help develop teaching and learning. I was an assistant head teacher, so that was great. And other good things by teaching, um, yeah, I guess with teaching, you never think about what's the point of what you're doing. Um, oh yeah, I'm teaching. Like that, that kind of has a very. It feels like it has a purpose built into it. Whereas I think sometimes when you're when you're working in other roles, it's like. Is, is this moving this widget up a bit really like my life's work <laughs> you know so yeah I think the good thing about teaching was like that sort of um inherent purpose that was kind of built into it um but yeah yeah I, I had a lot of fun in the classroom and I think like most teachers say um that's the fun bit when you can kind of close the classroom door or go into the classroom and just be with those sort of 30 students um as opposed to all the other stuff that's in and around education and schools, um, sort of making those hour-long sessions with those young people um, as helpful and useful and engaging and meaningful was kind of um, challenging 
and fun thing to do for for those years interesting i mean um, before we go into the 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 other side of all the teaching what you did my wife is also um like a, a, a leader in her school secondary school uh, more creative stuff less less like mathematics which is a very creative subject sorry but <laughs> math is a very creative subject yeah <laughs> well it, it's it's one of the core subjects is it did they call it core i can't remember how they, yeah. what, how they name them so but she does a lot of the stuff like arts design media music drama all that sort of thing so it's the less required <laughs> <laughs> qualifications the stuff that the kids kind of should be interested in but occasionally they just do it because they go that's ah, an easy ride I'll, I'll do art it's just sticking around for uh, two hours a day so but she gets a huge kick from just seeing these kids come in and go wow they've got potential but they, they do need that help and then seeing that evolution over time even in a short period she's like it's, it's so rewarding yeah and it must be wonderful to be mm. able to give that back yeah. to society as you say yeah and you know the, the moments when you get that are you know they might happen once a week you know if you're lucky that kind of thing you know so you're kind of living for those kind of that and it's a real adrenaline bush of oh yeah that's why i'm doing this or that's why it's there and you know sometimes it's more than that but often it's kind of like it's hard work in that sense of trying to you to stay positive and motivated and helping the children, and young people you're working with, stay positive and motivated. Stay positive. It's, it's difficult though, yeah. and I think this is this is what I was going to allude to: is what were the the, the harder parts you had in that time, and w- the challenges that you just really struggled to get overcome as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess like schools are kind of high stress environments with not a lot of margins. Mm-hmm. I think I I did realize that more when I moved out of it, but the kind of reality of um. There's not opportunities for um, if people need more time or if the the reduced workloads not really there if people need that because class bodies need to be in rooms and that you know there's staffing pressures and those kind of things. I finished reading a book a few days ago about um op- I think it was called Open and it was it was about how learning has changed and how workplace learning and school learning has been slow to catch up with with the change. And I think there's a reality that we're quite still an authoritarian driven kind of experience. You know, central government says what we need to do, tell local government and academy chains, tell head teachers, tell teachers, tell students. And there's this kind of pressure of or this kind of pushing down of pressure from from prime minister to, you know, Johnny, who's just walked into his year eight class. Um, and that kind of compounds on top of there. So it's quite a high stress environment in that sense. There's that like exam results are ridiculous. You know, like if, if you watch The Wire when it was on a few years ago, that kind of sense that if you measure something, if there's a statistic that you're going to measure something on, everything changes to maximize on that statistic. It just like without well, anyone doing anything else. So when you say exam results are the most important things, things like art get pushed to the side or thing when you say core subjects maths english and science are really important so w- that means that timetables change because we need to do well in league tables because parents look at that and ofsted looks at that and so there's quite a lot of pressure in that which can lead to people feeling insecure and um, mental health stuff is huge among staff and students so it's really challenging i joke that i grew up when i left teaching um, like I felt like I was treated like an adult, even as like an assistant head. There's a reality that, you know, for someone like me who went from school to uni to school, there's still that, um, oh, it's the head teacher or it's the Ofsted inspector. Um, there's not that inherent confidence in what you're doing. There's more, you're always being judged and aware of being judged and aware that, oh, yeah, that challenge of making sure that you're confident and you can get on with it. And when there's so much pressure, you can forget that the fun is with the kids and the important thing is that they're learning when there's exams to be done and curriculums to be finished. And so that's, that's probably most of the challenges around that. Mm, yeah, I mean, you've touched on a few points there about you know the demands from the top, as it were, with, with education. Mm. It does feel very archaic and it, mm. it kind of takes away that autonomy that you want as a teacher as well and even as a head teacher because you yeah. i think every head teacher has different demographics to work with but when they're trying to comply with mm. ofsted and politics and all this you think you're yeah. ruining education you're, yeah. you're not allowing us to get the best yeah. out of the kids that we've got you're just telling us what we should be doing and when you talk about the metrics yeah. you go we're going to need to get 97 percent 
pass rates to, to get the right number of children to the school to get the budget yeah. to pay for all of this and to keep the staff and i hear it from my wife all the time we even had a conversation yeah. last night about this how it doesn't translate to me as someone who works in tech in modern industry that's quite you know dynamic they say, say the word dynamic it hmm. makes me feel sick but you know it's <laughs> a lot more humane way of looking at things right <laughs> and it just it kind of contradicts what you're doing in education with children Mm. in fact Mm. they are children at the end of the day they're not until they're 18 they are still children whether you can vote or fight for your country which is a different run from the time (laughs) um anyway i was was going with all this Mm. it was yeah it's around the fact that you know obviously you struggled with these pressures that were coming from the wrong points of what you were trying to do what did you try to do to overcome those mental challenges i guess more than anything it, it's interesting because um, part of the problem comes from like uh, we don't have a shared understanding of what school's for, like uh, what the point of education is. Like, is it to make students like citizens or workers or to pass on knowledge or like, what is education for? Is a huge kind of problem because we don't know and because we don't share that, we're kind of like ah. Uh, I guess we just keep doing what we're doing or there's like lots of like the back to basic stuff of Gove and that kind of moving almost backward steps of um, 19th century education methods to kind of, ah, but I think it kind of combat that it's about, it's that trying to help people have ownership over what they're doing. Being in leadership, there's not, I think there's a, there, there's dictatorships and there's leaderships, isn't there? And I think we're the model in education is, you know, a largely the model is um someone has all the answers, and it's hard for teachers to get out of that mode because they're used to having all the answers for thirty students, and so when they're school leaders, they want to have all the answers for their hundred staff, and so there's a kind of weird that the, the teachers can become the students of the head teacher in his, in their head in some way. I don't know. In terms of helping turn that around I think it's about helping so action research is huge I think helping people have try stuff out in their classrooms and um, get re- get feedback and try and be able to improve and and to be confident in themselves that they can change um, in, te- in tech we have code reviews and we have design reviews and we have feedback loops that are really short and rapid and they really impact what we're doing a teacher can go a whole year between um, someone coming in to look at their teaching and often top down judgmental the here's what you've done wrong and here's your grade if i was graded on every pr i think I, <laughs> it would be quite a paralyzing experience so i think like trying to find like more natural encouraging ways for people to try stuff out to get feedback and not and to want feedback because I think there's a sense of like um, teaching can be a very part of your identity kind of thing um, and someone saying oh you could do this better can be quite a uh, intimidating or like it can feel quite like you're like you were suggesting with your wife like it feels quite um, insulting for you to come in here and tell me I could be doing this better like you don't know how hard I work um, you don't know it's like you can get really defensive quite quickly so trying to disarm that defensiveness and to say yeah like we're all this is a journey we're all getting better and like how can we work together to find something that's going to help you help the students in your care and help everyone to have a more positive experience here so it's not about it's often said that the best head teachers manage to like be a shield to keep everything from outside changing too much from inside but i think that's also true in education it has to be almost true all the way down like the best teachers are trying to like make those students still have joy and excitement about their learning in spite of everything that's coming at, at them without going ah we need to finish this we need to get this course finished we need to get your final pieces coming up you need to make sure this is all in line and it can ha- be hard as humans when we're tired and exhausted and um, not to pass our stress on to each other and yeah i think kids are really sensitive to that so i think partly it's about it's about ownership and it's about finding ways where feedback is not only quick and speedy, but also people want it. Yeah. And I think, like you said, when you work in tech, we are, well, we encourage faster feedback as a general principle, um, whether it's by people, or through code, through the way that we build things as well. <laughs> I love to see the paradigms and the differences between 
different industries as well because I think we're quite very lucky in tech that we get these yeah. very forward thinking ways of thinking doesn't sound right way I say that <laughs> whereas education just needs to catch up I talk about my wife a lot with this because she's been in this doing mm. education 20 years nearly and as a, as a senior leader as well she's working across academies now mm. to try and improve the teaching as well as the kids and actually mm. improve the management of the teaching as well so she's kind of layering it up as sort of a consultant almost to kind of go well I see that working quite well mm. I see that working quite well let's pull this together in yeah. a little framework or a, a, a course or something Yeah. so she's very lucky that she's got this opportunity to do this and she does work with some people that get it mm. as well but I think the education out to your seniors is the hardest part in any job I mean I, in mm. tech I, I have con- difficult conversations with my mm. leadership my seniors yeah. Yeah. saying look why are we doing this why do you need this what's the point in doing this thing and having the confidence to ask for that and do it openly and honestly trying to get that into a teenager mm. good luck yeah honestly i mean i know they come across quite cocky some of them but they are they're dealing with their own mm. things at the time and to add that confidence into children is so difficult so mm. i'd love to mm. know how we could do this and i think we can mm. talk this all day yeah. we'll, we'll do this as a separate topic another time because i've got a a, another project I'd like to talk to you about based on all this oh cool yeah so yeah. let's put a pin in that for now and we'll we'll get you back on that one because I'm just mindful of time and we haven't even talked about what you do now so when you kind of went you know I've had enough of education I enjoy web development what happened to that tipping point where, where, how did web development get into your mindset into your conscious and um, how did you transition your role into into the agency work that you started off with it, it was a forced thing for me um, I have PTSD and some of the stuff we were talking about about conflict and, and loud noises and and those kind of things are kind of serious triggers i was managing for a long time and that got harder and harder to manage to the point that being school environments just weren't helpful so it became clear that i needed to transition and find some something to do and i think there's a lot of teachers who want to leave teaching unfortunately you know it's not an environment which people go oh yay i get to do this time 68 or 72 or whatever the um state pension age will be by the time you get there um you know people are often going oh no um how am i going to do this for another 30 years and as you get to more senior positions there's a oh but i'm i'm priced out or i can't afford to um to step sideways or to do something else and i think i was in a position where i had to look elsewhere um, and coding had always been part of like I, I love learning which is part of the reason why i love being a teacher and love doing action research and things like that but i love but coding had always been in the background um from like 11 and when i was thinking about well am i going to be able to get back into the classroom am i going to be able to get better to go back in again a mentor of mine suggested doing um an online boot camp and i hadn't really thought about it but i gave it a go um signed up for one called the code institute they're based out of dublin and they were remote which was great which meant that um i could do that sort of in and around what i was feeling well enough to be able to handle stuff which was great um, and what that allowed me to do was to go was to understand that all the stuff i've been learning for years and been like when I was spending holidays learning a new programming language or building something um, that to get an overview of how it all fit together. So I think I had like lots of silos of knowledge and what the bootcamp did was not necessarily taught me the individual bits, but helped me to join it all together. I was like, oh, actually I could do this. I know this and it's, oh yeah, that's really helpful. So I did that and then I was aware of not wanting to commute to London Um, I know you commute to London and hats off to you but I was very 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 um, clear that I didn't want to do that but I I also knew that I was going to have to take a pay cut to start you know I was so we kind of sucked it up and worked out okay we can manage this and um, made some changes Um, and I looked around and there's two companies I was sort of interested in applied and I got a job at at Cogap um, who are a small digital agency um, based in Brighton. So you, you you took the plunge into CoGap in Brighton. So you were living in Brighton when you were looking at this career change then. And then the Code Institute in Dublin, was that something you did prior to moving to Brighton or was it just kind of coincidence? Yeah, no. So I, I did it in so just before I got the job at CoGap. Right. So as I was off work, Ill, I was off from teaching ill. Right. Okay. I was able to do that flexibly through. So yeah, that was. Uh, so the web development became a, a realistic route. I think before it was, oh, I suppose I could do something. But, you know, I've been a teacher for this long. Am I completely de-skilled for everything else in real life or 
all the rest of it. So landing a cog app was great. So they they they've cut their company. They're a small agency now. They're they were twelve or thirteen when I joined, and they've been going since eighty four. Wow. So they started off are making they work with um, Microsoft building CD ROMs, and they they did a lot of cool stuff with there. And their main business is working with um, cultural institutions like um, museums and libraries and art galleries, and helping them deal with big data before big data was a thing really so once you've digitized the collection what do you do with it how do you make documents interesting how do you make them searchable and discoverable how do you make 3d objects that you've got these renders of uh, how do you make that exciting and helpful and useful so you know they they work in, in that space they work really internationally with you know from the british library locally and with um art museums like the MoMA in New York and um, the Los Angeles um, Museum of Modern Art and lots of um, lots of different places around the world and when I was there I got to work on two big projects mostly one was a was an art museum in Texas obviously um, called um, the Kimball Art Museum looking at um, how they could make their collection really interesting and help and, and discoverable and also on the Qatar National or digital library. Um, the QDL, which is a project between the British Library and the Qatar um, National Library, where with a digitization project that deals with sort of two million documents growing every day, really. And so making those searchable and interesting and um, how do you link them? How do you present them? Um, looking at user features, but also looking at infrastructure. So it's kind of the really fun thing of CogApp was that it's a small, small tech based firm, really, who go into museums and say, well, we have these tech skills that we can help augment and help you like bring your ideas to life. So I got to work everything from like AWS provisioning of basic services through to sort of Python and solar and things on the back end and um, through to like PHP and Drupal and um, Laravel in the middle and, and JavaScript and Vue and React on the front end. So proper full stack kind of um, journey through that, which is really exciting and really fun. And what was interesting for me was that working in that company was kind of, I felt treated like a human um, in a way that I didn't find in education. And I think when you're a company where you can say, actually, these people are um, what make us be able to make money. And if we don't look after these people, we're not going to be able to make money. And that and um, and it, it, it's cost effective for us to look after our people. I mean, that's probably, they're, they're lovely people. That's not, wouldn't be their primary motivation, but you can see that's, that could be where it could, you could get that from. Um, whereas in education, you only have a certain amount of money to be able to do to deal with and you need people in classrooms. And so, you know, you can't have away days for everyone that are team building and, you know, we can't take everyone out for nice meals. We can't do, you know, have fun things. We can't do hack days as often or we can't do, you know, we can't do all those things as tech workers. Um, we get to benefit from really helpfully and it's great. So, yeah, so I think working there was great because I learned lots was treated like a human and I uh, after about a year I started doing four day weeks which is amazing and I recommend to anyone four day weeks are are amazing I'll bet yeah <laughs> so it sounds like you went through that difficult time of going right okay I'm, 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 you're not quite enjoying schools obviously you took some time out which you needed mm. you used the opportunity to upskill a little bit and explore other areas and stuff that you actually enjoyed mm -hmm. previously anyway and then found the opportunities that worked for you, you know, at a cost, I guess, for initially, but you make you could make it work. Mm. But knowing yeah. that it was probably the right direction for you long term. Mm. So again, hats off to you. I mean, you mentioned the fact that I travel to London mm. daily and you made a decision, I don't mm. want to do that, yeah. which I completely understand. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think that there, there weren't the right opportunities for me nearby. Um, I had mm. to look for London and through circumstances in, in ASOS, I was kind of forced to move from Birmingham mm. to London office mm. so that again was like uh, yeah. you want your job you're gonna have to travel for it I, uh, and I do want this job I enjoy it I don't want to lose it so you know suck it up and it's worked it's fine I've acclimatized to the traveling so it's not too bad but anyway going back to your point around co cog app as you call it it sounds like the ideal role you know you're doing culturally cultural stuff so you still have like an education part to it it felt good and 
the environment was just ideal by the sound of it as well. So what what would you say would be the best part of working at Cogap then? Like I think with any good company it's the people, isn't it? So it's mm. so like great team. I really wanting to like really passionate about wanting to learn new things. Like I think you know, the company going for that long who'd worked with that many museums, you can imagine, oh well, we know it all. Whereas like there is a hunger for oh that's interesting over there what well, like could we use that could that make our work better could we improve on that so there's a real drive towards innovation and and learning in that kind of sense and the project you know it, like as you say like working with cultural institutions felt really helpful and useful and in terms of what we were doing was helping research be more effective with helping learning and like anthropological and sociology research to be possible in different and interesting ways and yeah so it was kind of and and also like the pre- the pressure wasn't the same so like my quality of life skyrocketed like there's that sense of people say teachers get all this time off you know you got like 12 weeks off a year it's mental you need it but, you know like <laughs> I, I feel like I, Teachers live on adrenaline, and so I I know all the way through, like especially for the last five years in education, like we couldn't plan to do anything the last two weekends of a half term, and then the first four or five days of a half term were a write off as I kind of slowly reacclimated to being a human being again, only to kind of get back in again. And you must find out with your wife as well, like the pressure. Uh, I think don't think people who don't know teachers or don't know people who work in education are aware of kind of that intensity of pressure and how exhausting that can be mm. to be able to do a job that felt useful and I was learning and I could go home at five and not have to think about anything was you know that was pretty good I'll bet so you're in a really good place by the sound of it at Cogat you found a job that you enjoyed you're with good people you're enjoying everything you did there it was a healthy balance as well put that word in there <laughs> and then let's say four or five months ago you decided to go freelance yeah so what kind of encouraged you to set that plunge and yeah tell us a little bit about that transition which i know a lot of people fear yeah um I, yeah this company's great and i'm just gonna leave huh uh, <laughs> there is a yeah it, it, it can feel i guess like a bit of a weird weird choice but i think what i was sure of is that I was safe at cog up and i you know felt you know as i talk about my ptsd it felt quite a a nurturing and health, healthy place for me to be at. And I knew if I stayed at Cogap that my technical skills would keep growing um, because they're just hungry to learn new stuff and they're pushing and they want they always want to make sure that they're offering their um, clients the best of what, what's out there and, and the most, of it, most um, meaningful and useful thing that they could do. But as a company that's been around for a long time and as a small company, a lot of problems have already been solved so how do they find clients? How do they nurture client relationships? What do they do when client relationships go south? What do they do when projects go south? You know, how, what do they do with project management? What do you do with, uh, and all, all those kinds of questions. In some ways we're already solved. And I'm someone who likes to solve those kinds of people problems as well. And in a company where I'm a, I'm a tech person and there are people, people who are doing some people stuff, I couldn't necessarily see how I was going to be able to grow those people side of things. I think we're thinking about side projects. I think we got me thinking more and more about you know having my own thing or um, growing my own thing. What would that look like? And if I do want to do that at some point, am I setting myself up for that now? Or I think I came to the conclusion that for now, where I'm at, I'm not. Um, I think I, I I want to grow that entrepreneurial business side and to. Stepping into freelancing was kind of the first step in trying to work out what that looks like. But yeah, I think in terms of um, lots of people fear it, I think I'd done that. I'd already made the jump from education into web development. And so I wasn't as scared. And we'd already set up how we would manage with less money. So, you know, I earn more as a freelancer. and But work maybe isn't as predictable, but it, it is quite predictable. But it's not necessarily secure. But I think... Like the, a lot of arguments are around that kind of sense of, is it more secure to have ten clients who are paying towards some of your salary, or one client who you could lose your job and lose all of your salary? There's that kind of what is security anyway. <laughs> so I think I think we'd, we we chatted. My wife and I had chatted lots about. Well, she saw I had itchy feet and like wanted to try it, and so we said, well, we'll give it a go. And yeah, it's so far so good. 
So, yeah, it sounds like you use that experience from the previous transition to your advantage there. You'd built up that confidence and braveness to say, we can do it. It's, it won't be easy, but I'm willing to give it a go. And as a partnership as well, you were both invested in it as well. And, you know, you had other options. Like you say, Cogap wasn't a bad place to be, but you had other things you, you wanted to try that, they'd already solved, which again, it's great to see that you've got that desire to push yourself beyond those comfort zones. I mean, we'll wrap this up in a bit, but how have you found that these first sort of five, is it six months now? I think you've been freelancing. Yeah, it's kind of, um, it's I, it's freelancing, but it's kind of not at the moment anyway. So um, basically I'm working alongside um, a friend of mine called Martin Edwards, and he had, a, he had a company for a year or so before I went freelancing called Spin Up. And almost all of my freelancing it's actually just me. It's me and Martin working together, um, and we're looking at oh, making that more formal going forward. Um, and spin up is um, about one of the things, or the main thing that we try to do is um, do rapid digital prototyping. So we work lots with digital agencies who maybe don't have in-house tech teams, but have ideas for products that they want to try out. And so we sort of get alongside them and sort of in a week or two or three weeks build version one that they can start testing and go, actually, yeah. Um, this is something we want to do so we've done a few really interesting bits of that and some sort of staff augmentation web development stuff to kind of keep stuff going as well but yeah it's been really exciting and um lots of really interesting stuff i've had to brush up on my react but cool so it sounds like it's going well and i think what you just mentioned there is a nice segue as well so you've got side projects on the go as well and we met through sort of side projects mindset as well you're very active in that on the side slack community we've got so what have you been working on and why what problems were you trying to solve is it personal things people things you'd identified in others tell us a bit about some of those projects that you've been working on uh, i think the joy of learning is kind of like over overstated so much but or, or, or maybe not talked about enough i really love learning new stuff and often like my side projects are a vehicle for me to try stuff out um, to give it a go, to learn a new technology and to, yeah, to have fun. And so like when I was saying about in, when I was in teaching, the, the second half of a holiday when um, I was I was kind of more human, I'd maybe learn a new programming language or I'd maybe start really doing something like that. And so side projects have always been that kind of vehicle to be able to, to learn, to be able to learn and be able to move those things forward. And I'm really interested to work out where side, my side projects are going because I often don't have any ideas. I feel like ah, oh, I could do this or this or this and so some things get partly down the track and and stop a bit the slack community that we, we're part of on the side um is great um, and one of the things that I've been trying and going freelance has been about um skilling up on seeing those little projects from start to end it's that finishing bit I sometimes don't get good at or I'm not as good at it's the oh that's a nice idea let's try that out a bit Oh wait, that's another nice idea out of there. It's that kind of shiny object syndrome. It's kind of hard to hard to overcome sometimes. I think with um, with spin up, what's been great is that almost all of our clients, our client projects, are like small little side projects. Um, so that ability to take an idea to talk with a client and coach them through like what are we trying to get out of this do that discovery process and get that initial iteration through i feel like that's skill that's skilling me up to kind of work out what my next idea is going to be so i've i feel at the moment i'm i'm still learning writing thinking and sort of keeping an open ear and an open mind to work out what is the side project going to be and the reality is it mightn't be anything beyond learning stuff blogging about stuff finding out stuff i'm working with egghead who are like a an online training platform to be um, a learner advocate for them which basically means like learning in public so like taking notes and sharing notes and attending stuff and and kind of there and i think my background in education and my love of learning has to fit into my side project somehow but I'm still not sure what that looks like. So it's still that kind of, ah, well, I'm still I'm still in the discovery process about where my side projects are going and that kind of thing. And what keeps me passionate is just learning new stuff. I really want to keep doing that. I think in, in freelancing and in small businesses, there can be a danger that there's so much going on that you lose the ability to do that, to use the, t- the time and the energy and the motivation to keep learning. And I guess in my web development career, I'm still quite early in that. But I really want to make sure I don't stop learning stuff. And side projects are your vehicle for that for me. 
I think really I, I love the fact that you are kind of using side projects as an opportunity to learn which I think is always a good thing. It's a perfect opportunity because it's no, there's no commitment. It's just you and your baby and you get to play with things that might come out or might not. And I think having that mindset that it doesn't have to work, it doesn't have to be successful, but you have learned something. So there is a success there for you individually. But as you know, I, I'm a sucker for a side project, this being one of them. And I, I'm aware that some things don't succeed. It's fine, but I've learned something from doing that. And having that mindset to go, it's okay, I learned how to build something in React or Gatsby as we both did last year. It was the Rugby World Cup Times website. I was like looking at a new way of building it. You suggested Gatsby, I think, at the time. I was like, cool, yeah, that's new tech. I'll have a play with that. It works and it ticks a box for me. So I learned a few things. No one bothered using it, but <laughs> it's fine. And I was like, yeah. it doesn't matter. I feel like I've achieved something and I might find that template works with a different sport, for example, in the future. Now, it turns out we're rebuilding the Formula One calendar in a completely different stack but it's fine again we're all learning through this so yeah i think you hit the nail on the head of that though the fact that as long as you're learning that's probably the main benefit of side projects if other people enjoy it brilliant mm -hmm. if you've enjoyed it the most mm -hmm. important thing is that your phrase of the joy yeah. of learning i think that might come through quite a lot here and your learner advocate stuff with egghead that's that's something that i think we should probably tap into another time because that could be a massive tangent as well. Right, we talked a lot about work and side projects and coding. And I think, you know, we, we understand where you're at now. But you are a family man. You're married with kids. How the hell do you balance all this stuff out? Especially as a freelancer now, how do you find those boundaries to just enjoy your family and your personal time, but also enjoy work as well? Yeah, I think when you were um, pitching the idea of this podcast a few months ago, we were talking about looking at your logo and we were talking about what does balance mean? Like, does it mean equal amounts of each thing? Like in a 24 hour period, should I have, you know, eight hours of working, eight hour, hours of making and eight hours of living? And that we're sort of talking, we're trying to, to think that about. And I think the balance thing is a, um, it doesn't mean equal time, does it? But when the balance is right, that um, each of them feed each other well. And when one of those, and I think your three identifying of that make, make live life and work is a really helpful kind of like demarcation. You know, working is really important in terms of like purpose and meaning and also funding life. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's really important to kind of keep that going. Making is really great in terms of keeping passion and keeping enjoyment and doing something that's not just for money or not just to achieve maybe a goal. It's for like, the good of it almost it has an, a value in that but like the life thing i feel like is that kind of important element i think so i've got yeah two boys my, i've got a five-year-old and a seven-year-old my wife and i've been married for 10 years just gone december it's been great and yeah i think i've always been pretty good at that boundary thing i was a bizarre person i got home from work at six and almost always i was able to stop then you know, I got I get to work at sort of seven. I'd stay till about five thirty six at school, and I would try to keep it there, um, so that when I got home, I didn't have to. I didn't have that stack of books just sitting there on the kitchen table waiting for me to mark. I was m mostly able to do that, and that sort of paid off because with freelancing, I'm able to do that as well. Um, I have a separate. I've got. I. I. We were. We we're talking earlier. I'm sitting in my shed, and I'm able to work here, so I'm able to then close the shed and lock it up and head into the house at the end of the day. But I'm also able to, like when the boys get home from school, I'm able to nip out and like have a cup of tea with them and I head back out again. You know, there's that flexibility, which is enriching, which has been really helpful. I think like having interests that we do together. So like like yourself, I'm, I, I love um, getting away camping. We've got a camper van. I love getting away, um, like sitting around a fire. My wife runs. So, you know, a Saturday morning might look like her running from our house to the seafront, which is about a sort of five miles um, to get where she runs to. We'll drive down. Um, we'll make bacon sandwiches in the van and maybe go for a swim if it's a hot day or just, you know. So, you know, it's those kind of um, those little things that have been really helpful to be able to, to make that all balance in some ways it's that i used to be a math teacher and the maths kind of side of my head or the physics kind of my head is that kind of you balance things out by but some things are heavier i think experiences with our families like we don't get them we're not doing them as you know for the 40 hours a week that maybe we're doing or 60 50 hours a week you're maybe working but like making those as impactful and and like being present for them i think is really makes it 
possible. So it's that kind of, I find trying to t- not have devices near me when I'm reading or playing with the boys. I'm trying not to, you know, to be able to play games with them or to be present with them when they're around makes it more meaningful. And then trying equally with, with Kath, I think there's a reality that sometimes at the end of the day, we can veg out in front of a TV and um, there's times where you yeah, actually we need to go actually we need to put some effort into this otherwise we're going to you know don't want to take each other for granted don't want to take the boys for granted and just kind of yeah thinking about balance and thinking about are we getting it right is almost like the most important step towards getting the balance because we won't get it right and we don't get it right but we readjust and we try and then oh man we went too far one way and you know I think I think the trying bit and being mindful of is it working or is it not and being reflective about that makes makes a difference. Wow, loads of things in that that I'm probably going to miss as well. <laughs> right, okay. The the running part that your wife does, I'm going to I'm going to have to put a pin in that one for later, but do you do the exercise that kind of complements that or do you just kind of you don't need it? How, how do you do you fit anything in like that? Um I'd go to the gym. So okay. um so three so three times a week I'll go to the gym for 45 minutes or something like that. And when I worked at cog up that was a a 15 minute cycle up and down the hill so they're trying to find little ways to build those um to build that in the commute from the kitchen to my shed is um slightly shorter <laughs> um so yes yeah, so lunch times i'll maybe go out for a walk or take the bike out for a bit so just yeah trying to make sure that um i keep my brain active that way as well um but yeah but running's not never been for me but but kath is definitely she loves it that's cool. So the, I'm glad you get fine time for fitness because it's one of the things I'm mindful of now. I'm getting a bit older as well. You talked about the camper and chasing your wife down to the beach almost with the boys and having bacon sandwiches when you got there. I love that idea. It's kind of like you're making fun out of it as well. She's got a goal. You've got a kind of a reward for her at the end. And yeah, yeah, yeah. the boys obviously love this. It's like, race mom, we can beat her. You know, yeah. I, I love the fact you're making the most of those opportunities to just get out with the family and get away from the screens, which you talked about as well. So you, I don't think you... Did you say you do game or you don't? Um, not, re- not really. Um, I, I, I kind of go through phases of it. Like I have a, a Switch and a PS4 and I'll get into it, but I, I kind of never, it never sticks. <laughs> it's kind of, I feel like, oh, I should probably be better at this. But yeah, yeah. But yeah, my seven-year-old loves Mario on the Switch and would gladly just do that forever, but goes into a strange headspace when that happens. So it's that kind of, balancing screen time for for them is really like so and helpfully modeling that is sometimes yeah more challenging <laughs> indeed yeah my lad is very similar he if he give him the opportunity he would just sit on his um i think it's xbox one all day or his switch just doing whatever it is with them too so try, i'm trying to encourage him out right just read as well and it, actually he's getting a lot better at his reading i think his teacher even rewarded him the other day saying i think you're one of the best readers in the class at the moment good lad well done but i know you're a big reader as well so yeah when do you fit this in because you're obviously <laughs> you've got a busy lifestyle you've got family time and you know you do do fitness as well so when do you fit in the books and what kind of stuff do you kind of read as well just out of interest as well yeah so i do read a lot as um it's funny because so i'll often be reading when the boys are so they have their sort of 40 minutes of screen time together i'll often read during that in the evenings we try to turn off the screens by nine and then we'll read sort of for an hour or so then and then yeah it's that kind of if i get the bus i'll bring a book if i got you know it's that kind of and yeah i vary between reading sci-fi pulp fiction that kind of like sort of not really oh that's quite fun um and lots of i would read a lot of non-fiction um so i'm like ridiculous and so i get up in the morning so my boys are awake at I get up at 5.30. The boys are sometimes up at 6, 6.30. So I'll often have a half an hour or an hour to read in the morning before they get up. I'm very, you're, you're making, you're saying, wow, I'm very impressed. I'm seriously this. impressed. But, but no, yeah. I, I, I mean, those days I work from home, I have good intent to get up and do something with that time. Normally it's housework and then it's school runs and it's, oh, it's work now. So fitting that stuff in is really difficult and I'm fair play to you to, for making that work. <laughs> well, I think I think it's that hunger for learning as well and knowing like like um, there's a Japanese concept called Kaizen, which is that kind of being 1% better. And it's that kind of, you know, trying to make sure that every day, or, you know, that I want to learn something more. So I'll often have three nonfiction books going where I'll read a chapter of each over a couple of days. And then, because I find sometimes, especially with sort of heavier books 
that if I try to it'll, I'll get disheartened if it's kind of slow going where if there's kind of two or three going at a time I can kind of keep interested in all three um, which yeah is weird probably but it also helps me link the ideas as well so I, reading recently I, over Christmas um, I read a book called um, Taking Smart Notes or Smart Note Taking which is recommended by a guy called Tiago Forte who talks about building a second brain about how, it, how do you externalise your thinking like if you just read an interesting article on, on Hacker News or on, on The Guardian and read an interesting book and then move on like what's the point of that reading was it just like does it have any impact on what you're thinking and how you're growing and what you're doing and and this book about taking smart notes was interesting about like actually taking notes i read in the kindle and so being able to select and take a note rephrasing so like not just right not just quote not just highlighting but actually okay what's this actually saying how would you explain it to someone else all that kind of stuff and then every day, every couple of days, I'll download those notes from my Kindle to Rome Research, which I moved to after Notion. I was using Notion, but moved to Rome and kind of get those notes in and like, oh, this is like something else I was thinking about earlier on. And I'll add that together. And the idea is that I'll hopefully just make blog posts automatically as they as those ideas start to clump together. So, yeah, so that's been that sort of changed how I've read in terms of be more diligent about taking notes while I'm going through rather than just getting through it as quickly as possible there's still that little dopamine head of finishing books which is fun as well <laughs> but actually taking notes has actually made them more useful as well it seems like you've continued your academic mindset there as well of <laughs> don't just read it think about what you're reading and make your yeah. references out of it as well yeah so and i like the fact that you're using tech to your advantage there rather than as a kind of hindrance mm. the other thing I'm, I'm really sort of I'm perplexed by the idea that you're reading three books at a time mm. as as someone who encourages finish one thing first yeah. <laughs> and then move on to the next thing. Yeah. But I can kind of see where you're coming from the way you talk about it because it's not just the fact of going, well, I need time to process what I'm doing mm. um, so I can, I can jump between two or three safely. But I actually want to link this stuff up mm. and that concept is brilliant and I love the way you kind of introduce this to me it's something I might have to try myself because I, I like the idea of reading a mm. couple of things at a time but either non-fiction and fiction so it's a mix of it as well that concept I might have to play with I'll test it myself and let you know how that mm. goes it's, it's, it's really cool I'm mindful of our time we're, we're coming up to the end of this of today's session and we are definitely have to recap yeah. again soon because there's so many other things I want to go into with you yeah, but let's wrap it up with the same question I ask everyone is if you were going to enter the tech industry again for the first time what would be your like number one tip to yourself or anyone else who's kind of ent- trying to enter the industry oh that's a hard question i wasn't on your list but okay <laughs> gotcha <laughs> so if i was going to oh. there's a theme with what you've been saying today though but i reckon it is around learning really yeah i think it's like not assuming that you need to know everything before you get there you know, I think there's both ends of it. There's the imposter syndrome of feeling like, oh, I don't know enough. But there's also the kind of resting on your laurels kind of side of things as well. So I think, yeah, there is that. A lot of people complain that we have to relearn our stacks every six months because um, cause stuff has changed. And that, and that can be annoying when, you know, but actually if it's improving, which sometimes it is, sometimes it seems to be changing just for the sake of it, but when it actually improves how we think and making links to other things, there's that reality that when we learn different languages, human languages, we think better and being able to think about, well, this is how I do this in PHP and this is how I do this in JavaScript, this is how I do this in Python, which is better or what are each of these, how are each of these informing um, what I'm thinking about now. So I think don't be afraid to learn stuff. Um, I'm always going to get, I guess, head up, head back there. And yeah, don't feel like you have to know everything before you get there, which is hard because, you know, when you look at most junior level things, there are, there seem like the required specs seem quite high. You know, two or three years of professional development for an entry level position feels somewhat unrealistic. But yeah, so I guess it's that kind of, don't think you need to know everything and yeah, keep learning. Yeah. I like that. That's cool. I can relate to that recently we, when I've been trying to recruit for the team at the moment. Uh, again, back in tech, we've 
got this guy coming in he was interviewing he, he came across so well but he's quite new to the industry only got about 18 months experience but he had this passion for learning mm. and he, he came across in his interview even following the interview we were like would you like the job he was like well what career progression options are there like educationally as well and the fact that he was asking this just made me go this guy we need to get him in because he just loves mm. to learn and there's so many opportunities for it where we are so yeah i'd, I'd completely advocate that yeah. mentality it's just mm. don't be afraid to learn keep wanting to learn mm. but don't be intimidated by how much you need to learn mm. as well you don't become content in it as well so very good advice mm. kev you're still a good teacher i, I want to get you back into education <laughs> <laughs> don't do it for the stressful reasons though you know it's just like yeah how yeah. do we find a good better yeah. win for this um yeah i think we could rant on all day about all these sort of things but it's been wonderful to hear your journey so far and i, I really admire your sort of mentality about just pushing yourself into uncomfortable positions but doing something with it for anyone who wants to reach out and have a chat with you about these sort of things how can they get hold of you yep so i'm on twitter at at do learning oh great learning name <laughs> yeah there you go um so yeah so keep learning um and yeah so reach out to me on twitter um and then come join our on the side slack group if you um if you want some support for your side projects as well nice link yep <laughs> 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 yeah as, as kev mentioned he is on the on the side community in slack uh we've got probably about 15 20 people in there now five or six regulars anyone's welcome he's, he's mostly side project focused but he just got on tangents as well so yeah um you can come and join both of us there well thanks ever so much kev for joining me today i'll keep calling you kev i should call you kevin That's fine i don't mind thanks <laughs> ever so much kevin for joining me today um i'm sure our audience will love to hear what you've been through and i will definitely get you back in the future for a, a follow-up and awesome. see how things are going well it's been a lot of fun thanks for having me it's a pleasure matey thank you to everyone for listening and in particular kevin for joining me on this episode of the make a life work podcast as kevin just mentioned he can be found as at do learning on twitter or as we also discussed you can find us both in our on the side slack community just pop on over to on the side.network which should take you straight through to open registration you can find all the details about this podcast and all the other episodes at sidejobbling.com slash make life work or you can find us on all the popular socials as make life work pod we're on all the popular podcast apps including apple spotify and google so make sure you subscribe rate and maybe leave a little review so we know what you think of it all finally if you're interested in the making of this podcast there's a series available at youtube.com slash sidejobbling where i talk about things like the logistics the branding and all sorts of other relevant topics that's all from me join me next time when i'll be inviting along another guest to talk about balancing their work life and side projects on the make life work podcast Thank you.